Hebrews 12 and 14, which we have referenced on more than one occasion, says, Pursue peace with all people and holiness without which no one will see the Lord. So I would say it's a pretty important subject as we examine these biblical truths and as we examine the biblical principles that we have looked at and will continue to look at. It matters because the Bible says it's essential to our salvation. Why don't you look at someone and just smile at them? Amen. And then tell them it's essential. And there you go. Some of you don't believe that, but that's all right. You still are here. God's gracious. Amen. Tonight, though, we're going to begin focusing on the inside outwork of the Spirit as it relates to now our appearance. To be sure, the Bible clearly teaches that God expects that our internal holiness impacts and influences and transforms our outward appearance, our outward actions. And so our external witness reflects our internal holiness, and God expects that. There are three common questions when we begin to talk about our appearance, though, that can be asked with genuine uh, intent. One is, do the standards of conduct and appearance given in the Bible, do they still apply to us today? And the biblical answer to that is a resounding yes. Another question that can be honestly asked is, couldn't they be discarded in favor of a lifestyle that is less conspicuous and offensive to our modern culture? And the biblical answer is a thunderous no. A third question can sometimes be, does God really, does God really want us to be different from everybody else? And the biblical answer is, Absolutely, yes. Here's just a quick snapshot of why the Bible gives those answers. Titus 2 and 11 says, For the grace of God has been revealed, bringing salvation to all people. And we are instructed to turn from godless living and sinful pleasures. We should live in this evil world with wisdom, righteousness, and devotion to God, while we look forward with hope to that wonderful day when the glory of our great God and Savior, Jesus Christ, will be revealed. He gave His life to free us from every kind of sin, to cleanse us, and to make us His own, very own people, totally committed to doing good deeds? I'd say that answers those questions pretty clearly. 1 Peter 2 and 9, but you are a chosen generation, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, His own special people, that you may proclaim the praises of Him who called you out of darkness into His marvelous light who once were not a people, but are now the people of God, who had not attained mercy, but now have obtained mercy. And so I'll say it again. The Bible plainly teaches that God expects an external witness of our internal holiness, and it seems pretty clear. Do you believe that? Say amen. Now, the first principles governing this, though, governing our outward appearance, are revealed in the very beginning. These first principles are revealed when God created, when God spoke, and when God formed, we realize that there were established divine order and gender distinction from the very beginning. Hear the word of the Lord in Genesis 1 and 27. So God created man in His own image. In the image of God, He created him. Male and female, He created them. 
Then God blessed them and God said to them, be fruitful and multiply, fill the earth and subdue it, have dominion over the flesh of the sea, over the birds of the air, and over every living thing that moves on the earth. So starting at creation, the Bible then consistently affirms and applies these foundational principles of gender distinction and divine order over and over and over and over all the way through the old and all the way through the new. So what we are teaching tonight is not a verse pulled out of context and twisted. It is the whole witness of Scripture beginning with creation. What, how does the Bible apply these two principles? First, our biological sex is who God created us to be. Now that has immediate relevance and application in our current culture, specifically understanding the transgender movement that has become so prevalent. Transgender has become an umbrella term for the various ways that people differentiate, di differentiate pardon me for butchering the King's English, but the way people differentiate between their biological sex and their gender identity. It's become an umbrella term. But underlying that difference and underlying that movement is this idea that people should be free to choose their gender regardless of their biological sex. However, the Bible has something else to say. The Bible teaches that God deliberately made us in His image as male and female. So our sexuality and our gender are not just about what we do. They're not just about how we feel, but it is about who we were made and meant to be by God. To quote Dr. James Emery White, being male and female is inextricably intertwined with being made in the image of God. This is why whenever a man presents himself as a woman or a woman presents herself as a man, it is unequivocally denounced, and I would add, by the Bible. So as spirit-filled believers, we should not condone and we certainly should not practice what the Bible condemns. Amen? That's not a political statement. That's a Bible statement. But I'm glad you clapped, but let's continue. For neither should we condemn the person struggling with their gender identity. There may be a mental illness they didn't choose. There may be genuine confusion of roles and identity based on environment, abuse, neglect, rejection. As Christians, our role is to always extend the love of Jesus Christ to those who are wrestling with transgenderism. Only Jesus Christ can heal and mend that which is broken, and only Jesus Christ can empower and equip them to accept their biological sex as their God-given identity. Amen. Again, we're talking about the relevant application of these biblical principles of gender distinction and the divine order of creation. So our biological sex is who God created us to be. But secondly, God created male, the male and female united in the lifelong covenant of marriage to procreate. He blessed that. He said, be fruitful and multiply. Thirdly, when we're applying these principles, as we talked about last week, Homosexual acts are a sin against God. They are a rejection of God's divine order. 
Paul in 1 Corinthians 6 and 9 was pretty clear. Don't you realize that those who do wrong will not inherit the kingdom of God? Don't fool yourselves. Those who indulge in sexual sin or who worship idols or commit adultery or are male prostitutes or practice homosexuality, those are the people, and the list goes on, that Paul is clear they will not inherit the kingdom of God. Again, that's not political, that's not social, that's not about any type of hatred. It is biblical truth of a loving Savior. Amen? Amen? Like transgenderism, homosexuality is simply at its core a rejection of God and a rejection of His created order. Fourthly, when we're talking about these principles, there is a diversity of interests and appearances within the framework of gender distinction. Not every boy has to enjoy sports. Not every boy has to climb trees. Not every boy has to play in the dirt. Not every girl has to play with dolls, love the color pink, or enjoy cooking. Amen? And if you want to, you want to mess up the psychology of your child and put them in gender confusion or rejection, put them in a box and insist on cultural parameters that are taught and not biblical. Amen? Nothing wrong with playing in the dirt. Nothing wrong with the color pink. Amen. But there is room for diversity of interest in gender distinction. But let's be clear about this. Our current Western culture intentionally seeks to blur gender distinction, mock the sanctity of marriage, and aggressively promote unrestrained sexuality. If you don't think that is the agenda of the day, well... You're pretty secluded. God bless you. Amen. And we should not pretend that this cultural pressure doesn't impact us or that it doesn't impact our children. As parents, we should be careful guardians of our children to ensure that they are not put in vulnerable environments where they could be preyed upon by any predator of any type. As parents and guardians, we should carefully monitor and control the friends, the entertainment mediums that they engage with to ensure that they are not deceived by the militant and misleading advocacy of the transgender and homosexuality agenda. And beyond all of that, as parents, family members, and friends, we should consistently teach and model biblical principles and affirm the beauty and wonder of God's creative order. That means we should live in obedience to God's Word and that we should walk in the Spirit and that we should model the covenant blessings of being in a right relationship with God. And when they see the blessings of obedience to the Lord Jesus Christ, they will not want the chaos and the confusion and the hurt and the pain that this world has to offer. So let me be crystal clear. We cannot condemn those who are confused by, attracted to, or entangled by transgenderism, homosexuality, or even fornication or any sin for that matter. But neither can we condone these acts and appearances which violate God's word. Instead, we must love them. We must be gracious to them. We must pray for them. We must point them to the healing power and affirming purpose of Jesus Christ. That's our role, to be a light to a better way, to be a voice of hope, to be a hand that offers gracious acceptance as we lead them to a God who is able to heal that which is broken and deal with the inner being, no matter how twisted, no matter how abused, no matter how shameful they may be. Jesus Christ loves them. Amen. 
Amen. The Bible then also doesn't shy away from affirming the divine order of creation and applying it with regards to the family or household roles and relationships. God created Adam first. And from Adam, he created Eve. And then came the children. That was God's order, not ours. We see this in Paul's teaching to the Ephesians. Ephesians chapter 5 and verse 22. For wives, this means submit to your husbands as to the Lord. For a husband is the head of his wife as Christ is the head of the church. He is the Savior of his body, the church. As the church submits to Christ, so you wives should submit to your husbands in everything. No one says amen at this point. That's very good. It is the Bible. And maybe since Paul didn't have a wife, he didn't have to worry about writing the inspired truth that God gave him. But don't, don't ever regress. He was inspired of the Holy Spirit. And unless you glow for husbands, this means love your wives just as Christ loved the church. He gave up his life for her to make her holy and clean washed by the cleansing of God's Word. This isn't in the notes, because I don't interrupt the Bible passage, of course. But if the standard is that Jesus gave up His life for her, it's kind of hard to justify why you can't give up your chair to help her. Or you can't, go with her there, or you can't help there. That's not your place. Maybe that's your environment, but it's sure not the Bible. Because the standard is as Christ gave up His life for her. So anything short of martyrdom is not too much. The men normally kind of slide through this real easy, so I just thought I'd level it out just a little bit. Verse 27. Back to the Bible. He did this to present her to himself as a glorious church without a spot or wrinkle or any other blemish. Instead, she will be holy and without fault. In the same way... Husbands ought to love their wives as they love their own bodies. For a man who loves his wife actually shows love for himself. So, according to the Bible, whereas men and women are equally loved by God, viewed equally by God, their complementary roles and relationships are distinct. And I realize that culturally and socially, gender roles are sought to be blurred into being a world that's just unisex. But the Bible draws us back to principles that, uh, that cannot, that do not position us to go along with that flow. The issue is not about inferiority. Or superiority. The issue is about responsibilities and relationships. And furthermore, the Bible never devalues women and children like many pagan religions and misguided Christians certainly do. Amen? The Bible elevates and sees the complementary role and the equal status before God. How would you like to be a woman in Afghanistan right now? Thankful for the biblical principles of God's word. Amen. Amen. Now, household roles deserve their own series of study, but suffice it to say 
that when men and women and children submit to God's created order and authority, they position themselves for God's blessing, God's power, and God's protection. Amen. Now, again, we're dealing with these foundational first principles, gender distinction and God's creative order, divine order. And while God gave men and women distinctive and unchangeable physical characteristics outside of modern day surgical mutilation, of course, he also granted us distinctive but changeable physical characteristics, at least one, and that is our hair. To this end, when we talk about our hair, the Bible plainly teaches, and we'll just say it right up front, that men should have short or cut hair and that women should have long or uncut hair. Again, this is not cultural norms. This is biblical principles. I, we understand that. We find the New Testament teaching about hair in 1 Corinthians 11, which not coincidentally also includes Paul's teaching on communion. It is unfortunate and sad and ironic that the same chapter that includes the universally cherished Christian sacrament of communion also includes one of the most debated and ignored passages in the Bible. How does that happen? Here's what Paul wrote. Verse 1, imitate me just as I also imitate Christ. Now I praise you, brethren, that you remember me in all things and keep the traditions just as I delivered them to you. In other words, the traditions and the ordinances Paul teaches here, they are accepted teachings of the New Testament church, and Paul wants to establish that right up front. You keep the traditions just as I delivered them to you. Verse 3, But I want you to know that the head of every man is Christ, the head of woman is man, and the head of Christ is God. Notice, Paul does not appeal to cultural standards. This is not about local customs. Paul points instead all the way back to creation. If he was dealing with local customs, he would have based his argument on local cultural standards. He's not dealing with local customs only. He is dealing specifically with eternally established principles back in the garden of gender distinction and God's divine order. Inspired by the Holy Spirit, Paul anchors his teaching in the authority and mutual submission of God's divine order, just as he did in the passage in Ephesians that we just read just a few moments ago about household roles and relationships. In verse 4, Paul continues, Every man praying or prophesying, having his head covered, dishonors his head. Having his head covered here refers literally to the man's head. And dishonors his head possibly refers to Christ based on the context of the verses we just read. So every man praying or prophesying, having his head, his literal head covered, is dishonoring his head, which is Christ. But it's critical to notice here as we get started in 1 Corinthians chapter 11, that the only covering that is specifically identified in this passage is long hair. We're not talking about baseball hats. We're talking about long hair. So now verse 5. But every woman who prays or prophesies with her head uncovered dishonors her head, for that is one and the same as if her head were shaved. Unlike the man, distinct from the man, when a woman prays or prophesies, her head should be covered or she dishonors her head which would be her father or husband. Further, Paul here kind of digs down, and he insists that a woman praying with her head uncovered is equivalent to a woman praying with her head shaved, 
which biblically is a mark of shame. Verse 6, For if a woman is not covered, let her also be shorn. But it is shameful, but if it is shameful, rhetorical, for a woman to be shorn or shaved, and it was, and it is, let her be covered. Now, shaven, I think, is pretty self-explanatory. But what does shorn mean? It's translated from the Greek. See if I can say this. Kero, right? My uh, Greek teacher would probably just be huddled down in misery right now. But that Greek word, what does that mean? It means to have one's hair cut or sheared. So what does shorn mean? It means to have one's hair cut or sheared like a sheep, right? In other words, what is Paul saying? Paul is teaching that since it is a shame or a disgrace or even dishonest for a woman to have her hair cut or shaven, then she should have a covering on her hair, which again, in the context of 1 Corinthians 11, means long, uncut hair. Now, even if one digs in and insists that covering here refers to a physical veil, it does not negate the point of the passage of verse 15 that a woman is to have long, uncut hair. Verse 7, For a man indeed ought not to cover his head, since he is the image and glory of God, but woman is the glory of man. So man or, a, or men should have short hair. Men should have cut hair because a man with uncut hair or a covered head detracts from and dishonors the headship of Jesus Christ. Now, while a man could technically or legalistically maybe escape the definition of long hair by having his hair only cut periodically, he would be violating the spirit of the passage and he would be blurring gender distinctions which God does not allow. Amen? That's why practically at Atlanta West Pentecostal Church, we teach that men should cut their hair so it does not cover their ears or their collar. That's the practical application of the biblical teaching in 1 Corinthians chapter 11. Verse 8. For man is not from woman, but woman from man. Nor was man created for the woman, but woman for the man. Paul, again, the second time, bases his teaching on creative order and gender distinction established by God. Maybe the Holy Spirit understood that of all the teachings of Paul, this is the one that would be most hotly contested by evolving theological systems that were more about tradition than truth. Amen? So Paul not once, not twice, and as we will see three times, goes back to creation to double, triple, dog, dare, and prove his point. Verse 10, for this reason, the woman ought to have a symbol of authority on her head because of the angels. A woman's empowered place of submission, as symbolized by her long hair, aligns her to the benefits and the protection and the advocacy of God. And that includes power against and protection from evil spirits or demons. And Paul may also be referencing the pride and the rebellion that caused the fall of Satan and many angels so that a woman's uncut hair serves as a symbol of the power of divine submission, which may be an example to the angels and something they look on to see. Does a woman have spiritual power as evidenced by her submission, or is she in rebellion and therefore weak and vulnerable? All of that may be included in Paul's writing there. Here is what I do know, though. 
What Paul is not implying is that a woman's long hair has some kind of spiritually magical power that she can twirl around like a fairy godmother's wand and perform miracles. And though such conduct has marked some places teaching on uncut hair, it is not biblical, it is not right, and it is outside the authority of Scripture. It is a symbol of your uh, submitted authority. It is a representation of the supernatural power of God that is working in you and working through you, but it is not magical and it's not a fairy tale one. Amen? Amen? Verse 11, nevertheless, neither is man independent of woman, nor woman independent of man in the Lord. For as woman came from man, even so man also comes from woman. All things are from God. Paul again powerfully prevents anyone from concluding that one sex is superior to the other in the sight of God. The New Testament is always consistent. Men and women are equal in rights, but distinct in roles and responsibilities. Verse 13, judge among yourself. Is it proper for a woman to pray to God with her head uncovered? Does not even nature itself teach you that if a man has long hair, it is a dishonor to him? But if a woman has long hair, it is a glory to her, for her hair is given to her for a covering. Paul now references the divine order and the gender distinction established at creation for the third time. I think he's trying to make his point. So how long is long? Has long hair in verses 14 and 15 is translated from the Greek and it means to let one's hair grow or to let it grow or not to cut it. That's what has long hair means. In the original language, it means to let one's hair grow or not to cut one's hair. So how long is long? Long is hair that has been allowed to grow and has not been cut. That's long. Whether it's six inches or 60 inches. Whether it's thin or it's thick. Even when sickness strikes or accidents happen, if a woman's hair is not intentionally cut, it is long and it is glorious in the eyes of God. Amen? Thin or thick, short or long by measurement, if it is left to grow and it is uncut, it is beautiful to God. It is glorious to God. And you are honoring the Lord Jesus Christ. Don't be intimidated don't be ashamed and don't ever be in a comparison trap with someone who may have long by measurement hair. Amen? Amen. But practically, what does it mean the not cutting of the hair? Practically, that includes all and any means of shortening the hair. Not legalistic of shears or scissors, but whether it's razor or curling irons or hair rollers or chewing it off. If it's cut off and shortened, it is a violation of the Word of God. Amen? And then Paul concludes by undercutting anyone who wants to argue. Ladies and gentlemen, the Holy Spirit, God, is masterful. And in this passage, the Holy Spirit made sure that Paul ate ways to Sunday push back all of the ridiculous claims and disguised as theological systems that seek to explain away the Word of God. And he pushes back by teaching and declaring that the New Testament churches, that first century apostolic church, had no custom for men praying and prophesying with long hair or women with cut hair. He said, but if anyone seems to be contentious, we have no such custom and nor do the churches of God. Sadly though, some 
erroneously explain away this clear teaching. They limit it to specific circumstances of Corinth and merely a time-bound preference of Paul. Bound by ever-evolving traditions of their theological systems, they insist that Paul's instructions cannot be applicable to 21st century Christians. Tragically, though, they miss Paul's clear statement later in the same letter to Corinthians, in Corinthians 14 and 37, when Paul said, If you claim to be a prophet, or if you think you are spiritual, you should recognize that what I am saying is a command from the Lord himself. In other words, Paul's instructions in that context and throughout his letter were as a command from the Lord himself. Our hair is symbolic of God's creative order and gender distinction. And to abandon the symbol is to repudiate in the eyes of God that which is being symbolized and so the Bible teaches that men should have short cut hair and women should have long uncut hair. Amen. And if you're feeling a little uncomfortable and if you're wondering about past choices and decisions, John declared and wrote, For God so loved the world that He gave His only begotten Son, that whoever believes in Him should not perish, but have everlasting life. Paul then said, But God demonstrates His own love towards us, in that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. While we were still sinners, Blinded by culture, blinded by customs, blinded by child rearing, while we were still sinners. We didn't intend to be rebellious. We didn't live thinking that we were against God. We weren't always seeking to violate biblical principles, but our eyes were blinded. We were sinners deceived by the darkness of this world. But even there, Christ died for us. Much more then, having now been justified by His blood, we shall be saved from wrath through Him. For if when we were enemies, we were reconciled to God through the death of His Son, much more, having been reconciled, we shall be saved by His life. And not only that, but we also rejoice in God through our Lord Jesus Christ, through whom we have now received the reconciliation. If you're able, please stand. This is the love and this is the hope that we share with everyone everywhere. That they can rejoice with us and receive the reconciliation of being made right with God. Regardless of the pain, regardless of the dysfunction, regardless of the sins of the past, regardless of the choices of our actions and the choices of our appearance that have violated biblical principle of gender distinction and divine order, Jesus Christ loves us. And the good news is that when we seize upon His grace and when we come to Him in humble submission and repentance, He does not condemn us. And neither does He condone us to continue in sin. Instead, He says, as He did to that woman caught in the immoral act on that day in John 5, Jesus would say to everyone, Go and sin no more. Jesus said it best right before he gave his life for people like you and me. If you love me, keep my commandments. So motivated by his love for us and our love for him, 
I pray that each of us would choose to align our actions and our appearance to the principles of His holy word. That we would choose to perfect holiness in the fear of God.